are joined by Stephen Wagesbeck, who is the president of the Louisiana Association for Business and Industry, which is the largest um, advocacy group for business interests in the state. Um, prior to uh, going to lobby, Stephen was the chief of staff and general counsel for Governor Bobby Jindal. Uh, and prior to that, he worked on Capitol Hill for 10 years. He's a graduate of LSU. I think he's a graduate of the Manship School, right? Absolutely. He's a graduate of the Manship School um, <laughs> and uh, Catholic University Law School. So Stephen's here to talk to us about the Industrial Tax Exemption Program and other topics. Um, welcome, Stephen. Oh, I should say one more thing. Questions are limited to members of the press club and members of the working media. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Julia. I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. It's always uh, a risk when you sign up for a press club the day after Mardi Gras in DC, but you know, I'm a glutton for punishment. And so uh, late night late night flight back is not gonna stop us. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's been a couple of years since I've spoken to the press club, and I really do enjoy the opportunity to do so, um, especially at a time when there's a lot of important issues going on around the state. Um, there's two broad categories I want to talk about today, if I could. Um, one are some comments on the economy and some of the important policy decisions we have that impact our state's economic um, aspect, and obviously the IHL will be part of that piece of it. And then second, I'm talking about the 2019 elections a little bit more broadly, what the lobby is doing and what we're trying to do to prepare for what we think is going to be a very huge election cycle on a number of levels throughout the state. So. Let's talk about the economy first. Um, nationally, there's a lot of good to see uh, in the economy. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, but we hear from our members. And I tell you, let me step back for a second. For those of you that aren't familiar with lobbying, we're the State Chamber of Commerce, we're the State Manufacturing Association. We have 2,300 businesses around the state, from large company to small company to everyone in between. And we represent their, their best interests in Baton Rouge and DC and throughout the state. And so we listen to our members each and every day, and we try to reflect uh, what, what they need in order to grow and prosper here in Louisiana. So going back to the economy, what they're telling us is because of some of the tax relief that happened in D.C., because of some of the regulatory reform we're seeing, there's been an infusion of capital and hiring and investment throughout the country and in Louisiana. So Louisiana is benefiting from some of that. So that is the good news. But what I want to talk a little bit here is there are some warning signs on the Louisiana economy that we have to be mindful of. And I don't want to overreact to them, but I do think we have to address them. The national momentum kind of is glossing over some of these warning signs. Um, in Louisiana, personal income growth has slowed, and we have seen that the last couple of years. Our unemployment rate is high. In fact, it's one of the highest in the country. And we've got to get a handle on that as well. And I think what's most telling of that unemployment number is one of the factors that's going into it is another stat, which is our workforce participation rate. Right now in Louisiana, we have about a 58% workforce participation rate. That's the, that's the lowest it's been since the 1970s. And for those of you that are around the 70s, believe it or not, I, I was, um, the 70s led to the 80s, which was a very challenging time. The fact that we're at those levels is concerning. And I think there's a, a couple of reasons why. Um, over the last two years in Louisiana, We've seen more people leave the state than come into the state. In fact, we have the seventh highest rate of a shrinking population in the country. And so I think that's a part of it. Well, unfortunately, we have less of those young new workers coming in, and I think we have a little bit of an aging workforce or an ending career workforce. That's a, that's a trend that we have to get a handle on. Also in that participation rate, unfortunately, we see that there are some people who have said, you know what, I'm not looking for, for work right now. And so we have adult working age people in the state who aren't currently looking for a job. So those two factors are the biggest one with that low workforce participation rate. That's another stat that we think is quite troubling. We have to get a handle on. I also think that there are a couple other anecdotal things that I, I want to share with you all today. As a president of lobby, I spend a lot of time in my car on the road all around the state. And right? I just any member that wants us to go out there, I go, I listen, we, we get their feedback. Um, some of the things I hear, when I get on the road in I-10 and I go start going towards Lake Charles, if I stop in Lafayette and take a left on 90, and take 90 all the way down to the bayou, what I see and what I hear, there's a number of those service companies, those warehouses, kind of that backbone of the traditional Louisiana economy that are struggling. 
You see a lot of those yards are empty. You see a lot of those warehouses that have thin shelves. That is a fact. And you kind of have to get in your car to go see it, but it is alarming. And those folks are really concerned about where that goes. And I think that's another piece of that workforce participation rate is there. The other piece I would tell you, and it kind of gets outside of the tax mode a little bit, is some of the phone calls I'm getting. I'm getting phone calls from the ag community right now. And they're saying, we want to come in and talk to you. And I thought they wanted to come in and talk about tariffs or trade or something like that. No, but they're coming in and saying, we have to do something about lawsuits. These are unsolicited calls from the ag community. And they're, they're painting these pictures of getting crops out of the field, trying to bring them to the mill for product, and they're having huge problems getting affordable insurance, huge problems avoiding these 700 lawsuits on the road to the mill. That's an issue. The truckers, the commercial truckers, they're reaching out in big numbers. They're calling me. They're saying, listen, we have an insurance crisis brewing in Louisiana. They say, look, we can get two people to write commercial truck insurance. Two. If you go back several years ago, it was five or six. That lack of competition, that lack of ability to get those competitive rates is absolutely having an impact. We're hearing some of the commercial truckers are starting to contemplate, should we go set up shop in Texas or Mississippi instead? We can't lose those types of jobs. And then the other piece of the industrial contractors. I'm talking to them, and many of you all know, we have some of the best industrial contractors in the world located here in South Louisiana. And they're busy. That's a good thing. Unfortunately, what a lot of them are saying is, you know what, four or five years ago, I was 80% Louisiana, 20% Texas. Now that model is flipped. They're still busy. They're just not building here in Louisiana as much. So those are all some warning anecdotal evidence signs, along with the criteria and the uh, some of the stats, where I'm concerned about some of this economic softness we have that we have to get a handle on quickly. So how do you do that? Well, there's a laundry list of items, and I've only got 25 minutes. But I can tell you this. There are two policy issues I do want to touch on today that I think absolutely address those issues. One is ITEP, two is tort reform. So we're going to start with ITEP real quick. Passed out, I'm uh, possibly here, maybe at the end we'll be passing these out. There's a report that we're putting out today, Bobby. It's something that we've heavily researched and put out for a long time, and we're going to be distributing it across the state this, uh, today. But well, I want you to have a fresh copy as you walk out here today. And it's entitled, Why It Matters, the Industrial Tax Exemption Program. And if you don't mind me putting on my lame reading glasses for a second, I'm going to quote a couple things from here. Because I think it's important to walk through what it is. And the reason why is, when we've been talking about ITEP the last couple of months, it automatically goes down into the minutia of the contract, the minutia of the, of the presentation, who says who about what, all the name calling and all that stuff. I really would like to put that aside for a second. Take a more global look at why this program even matters. Why are we even fighting about it? Because I think it's absolutely critical, but it's a, something that many people don't even understand. So if you go into the first couple pages of this, of this uh, report, it talks about why is manufacturing important. That's what ITEP goes to bring. Manufacturing is absolutely the backbone of Louisiana's economy. It is 7% of our workforce. It's 130,000 people in this state. Many of those people did not need a four-year degree to go get those jobs. And oh, by the way, those jobs pay on average $87,000 a year. That is roughly double the national average. And those are big paying jobs for people all across the state that doesn't necessarily need a four-year degree, and it's a huge part of our workforce. And that doesn't even count the multiplier effect. Just the petrochemical manufacturing piece alone, just the petrochem, has a multiplier effect of 6.1. That means for every job you bring in, there's another six down the road. Who are those people? Those people are the car dealers. Those people are the IT companies. Those people are the print shops. Those people are the service companies. Those people are the small businesses, the mid-sized, the homegrown Louisiana companies that we always talk about wanting to save. Everyone loves to say that. What people don't realize is those are the people that are threatened the most when these big investments leave. I'll go back to an anecdotal evidence to tell you that. You know how I know that? Over the last couple of weeks, I am getting calls from those people. Because of what's going on in ITEP right now, the calls I'm getting, the worried calls, the frantic calls, are from the car dealers, from IT, from print shops. Those are the people most worried. And so those are the ones I think we have to listen to, and this report plays out why it's so important. So manufacturing jobs are important in Louisiana. The report goes on to say people make more money in Louisiana where ITEP exists. Let me say that one more time. The people of this state, in the parishes where there's ITEP heavy contracts, they make more money. In fact, of the 12 heavy ITEP parishes, with the greatest, excuse me, they all rank above the Louisiana average for annual weekly wages. 
citizens, everyday people, make more money at the take home for their kitchen table where there's ITEP parishes. I'll give you two examples. St. James Parish, it tops the list for the percentage of people employed in manufacturing at 35%, and it ranks seven for active ITEP contracts. The average weekly wage of people living in St. James ranks third in the state at $1,400, well above the U.S. average. Iberville, similar story, second highest weekly wage rate. The people in the parishes where ITEP exists are making more money than the parishes they not. That's good for Louisiana people, no matter how you look at it. The report goes on. It's not just the people of this state making more money where ITEP exists. Local governments make more money where ITEP exists. We say that again. Local governments collect more money where ITEP exists. Property taxes. The statewide average property tax per person is $935, but 11 of the top dozen ITEP parishes beat this average. Sales taxes. The trend holds true for sales tax collection, where 11 of the top dozen ITEP parishes collect above the state average in sales tax. So if you're an ITEP parish, you as a person, you're making more money on average. You, the government that represents you at the local level, making more money. That's not what you're hearing right now. All you're hearing is a take argument. That's not what the data shows. And we think this report will lay it out very well. So let's go a little broader. Why do we need it? Maybe this will just happen on its own. Maybe we don't need this type of program to see all those benefits. Well, the report also lays out an argument on that. One, I'll go back to a testimonial. This is one from Sassol that publicly said, the fact is Sassol did have choices regarding where to site our U.S. mega projects, and the tax incentives granted Sassol did heavily influence our decision making. In fact, if one particular exemption, the industrial property tax exemption, or ITEP, were not in place today, it is unlikely we would have chosen Louisiana for one of our largest capital investments in our company's history. There is no way that anyone can do a thorough analysis and not come to the conclusion that Sassol has been a game changer for Southwest Louisiana and Ripple all throughout I-10, I-12. That has been a huge win to have that multi-billion dollar investment. And they are telling us in their own testimonial that without ITEP, they wouldn't be here. That's, an, that's the testimony of how important that is. But if you want to get back to testimonials, let's look at some of the stats. Louisiana has a business tax climate of 44%. Louisiana has franchise taxes, 36 states do not. Louisiana has inventory taxes, 40 states do not. Louisiana taxes manufacturing utilities, 38 states do not. Localized tax collection and auditing, 48 states do not. All of those things stack up. So when you're a company and you're looking, where am I going to bring billions of dollars of investment? And you see all these challenges in the tax code. Since 1936, and especially 1974, ITEP has been there to give a path to where having that investment to come in here. All of those taxes I talked about, business pays roughly 49% of taxes in Louisiana. The national on average, 44%. So business is paying their fair share. And I have to say it that way because there's been this argument out of the capital the last couple of years that business hadn't paid their fair share, that we could have nice things, that everything would be great if business would just pay their fair share. That argument is not supported by facts. But the rhetoric has gone out of control the last two years. And I know it's not popular to say, and no one wants to hear it, but it's the truth. We have got to stop this rhetoric escalation that is destroying our business climate. We've got challenging numbers. We don't need challenging rhetoric to add to it. So what is the state of ITEP today? There's a discussion of local control, or whether to go back to state-only control. I want to make one point clear. I think the incorporation of local input is a good development, and I think it needs to be that way. But local input and local chaos is two different things. And right now in Louisiana, unfortunately, in some areas, we have local chaos instead of local input. Let me paint a picture of the, of the state we compete with the most, Texas. Texas does not have a personal income tax. Texas does allow for counties to go up to 100% on property abatement, similar to ITEP. And Texas does rank 15th on the business tax climate as compared to R44. That's before I even get into localized collection, before I even get into some of the other aspects they have. And so ITEP has kept us in the game. So right now, here's what I hear from companies where they're looking at Texas and Louisiana. With Texas, what they do is they go to the county level and they have a single point of contact, and they have a discussion with that entity, and they figure out what that local county wants to offer on tax abatement. Or they go to the county's website, 
and they pull it off because they know that no matter whether they're a big Fortune 500 company or Joe's Garage at the bottom, any business, they know they can go to a county, get a clear answer, figure out what they're willing to do for property abatement. That is not what we have in Louisiana right now because of the governor's executive order. What we have in Louisiana is you go to the Board of Commerce and Industry at the state level, you give preliminary approval. That opens up a local gauntlet that one must run through, okay? You have to go get four different resolutions from the school board, the sheriff, perhaps the municipal council, maybe the parish council, maybe there's a local municipal entity instead of you don't have any of those things like a police jury. Then if you're lucky to go through that unscathed, then you go back to the state and then you get an up or down from the governor on that. That's not local input. That's local chaos. So could this new world we're in right now in Louisiana be amended to look more like Texas, where they can get local input but do it in a way that doesn't create some of the angst we see? Why can't we have a single point of contact in each parish? Let the parish decide who that is. That would be getting local input and providing stability for business. Why can't the parishes put on their website and say, this is what we offer, so when you come and take a look, this is what you offer for. The information's out there. Why do you need the local gauntlet? Because that is what's creating all of this confusion and angst. And what we're hearing from companies, they're saying, you know what? We're not sure it's worth it anymore. We're just gonna put a zero in the spreadsheet and not look. We'll just go look at Texas because we can go to a county, we can get a clear answer on what they're willing to do, and then we can move on with that analysis. We can have local input out all the local chaos. It is possible. It will probably take a tweak in the executive order, or it will take one of these legislative vehicles that maybe will move in the session, or some other venue. We are indifferent to how the fix comes, but there's got to be a way to get local input without what we're going through right now. It is absolutely tra tragic, and if, I, if you really look through this report and all the positive aspects that ITEP does for people and what they earn, governments and what they collect, the average teacher pay in the ITEP parishes above the national average. Teachers make more money in those parishes. It is indisputable that ITEP, which brings a heavy manufacturing presence, which brings good jobs, good paychecks, good teacher pay, good local tax collections, it's all there for the taking. We always need to look to improve every incentive program we have. ITEP's no different. With this local piece, we've got to find a way to get that input without the chaos. And this report lays out some scenarios. We're open to others if people have them. But people got to stop the finger pointing and name calling and get to some true facts if we're going to really address this in a responsible way. The second piece, I would say, of the economic challenge is on the tort issue. Now, tort reform is a topic in Louisiana that gets talked about year after year after year, and it's really hard to pass. Politically, in that building down the street, it's almost impossible to pass something on tort reform. Trust me, I know. I've had my head under the anvil plenty of times in that committee trying to do it. But it has to happen at some point. And the reason why is because of the insurance challenge we're facing. You know, I have a 15-year-old son. He turned 16 in two weeks. I, like many other families who encountered that scenario, started looking into insurance rates. And if you've got a 16-year-old boy that you're about to get car insurance for, it's not a fun discussion with your local insurer. And you know what? The local insurer doesn't like having that conversation either. In Louisiana, we have the second highest auto insurance rates in the country. And those rates are almost double the national average. Almost double the national average. Now that is a huge spike to where it is. That hits families. That's hit those truckers I talked about earlier. That hits every small business that has to move their product and buy insurance for that. That's an absolute real issue. And what's most frustrating on the tort front is how simple and compromised laden some of the solutions are. Why do we have such high rates? Well, you'll get different theories if you ask the members of the trial bar. I'll tell you the theory that I have. The theory that I have in Louisiana, we have roughly the same amount of wrecks than most states. But when it comes to bodily injury claims, we're double. We're double the, the, the amount of bodily injury claims. Now, either the, the, the Cajun spice has softened our tissue and blood cells, and we're just genetically altered from the rest of the country, or there's a lot of stuff costing them. So how can they stop it? How can they put those costs in there? Well, in Louisiana, it's almost impossible to get a jury trial on a car wreck case. Because we have the highest threshold in the, in the state, it's hard to get in front of that jury. It's a lot easier for that attorney that's suing you to get in front of the judge they want, and if you do get a jury, to prevent what information goes to them. If you're wearing a seatbelt or not, we can't tell you because of the gag orders put in place. If you had your medical claims covered, we can't tell a jury because of the legislative gag order put in place over the years. 
there's some minor compromises on those fronts that I think we should try that could make a difference on this. And let me talk about members of the trial bar for a second. I represent business. The book out there in that building is, I have to be against the trial bar and everything. I want to tell you something. There is compromise to be had there. I know many members of the trial bar are just doing what the state's incentivizing them to do. We want to talk about incentives on the business side all the time. We talk about ITEP. We talk about all the incentives that goes in business. We have legal incentives put in law, which encourage lawsuits. They're just doing what the government's telling them to do. So if we modify some of these, I think some compromise can be had where the, the people who need the claims and need the recovery get it, but also we don't inflate our insurance rates anymore because I'm really worried about a hemorrhaging of trucking companies and the ability for our ag producers to get their, their products to the mill in a responsible and reasonable way. So that tort issue is real, and we're ready to work with anyone and compromise with anyone to try to get some improvements there, wherever we want to be at that table. So ITEP relief and tort relief, that's where we are on that front. The second category I said I wanted to mention a little bit was the elections in 2019. Now, the governor's race is going to get a lot of the, the, the pub and the coverage and all that stuff. I almost think that's not as critical as looking at some of the legislative races, quite frankly. Term limits are huge in Louisiana. In 2007, we had 70 new members of the legislature come into play. They brought an infusion of new ideas and perspectives, and it really rocked the way that cop capital worked for literally 60 years before. There's been growing pains along the way, there's no doubt about it, but there's also been a lot of new ideas that have come through that. So whether you like term limits or not, and everyone's got their own opinion, in this next cycle in 2019, the next wave of that, all of those newbies from 2007, now they're term limited. So we're gonna have between 60 and 70 new fresh faces, thoughts, perspectives in the capital in 2019. So we as an organization, we're trying to go out there and spread the word. We're doing regional boot camps where we're going out there and talk to business owners. Here's some of the policy issues that are out there. Here's how you run a campaign. Are you interested to learn more? Do you know someone who might want to run? Because we want to get more people who know what it's like to manage a payroll, who knows what it's like to have three loans at the bank and not show if you can keep your doors open for another month. We want to have people in the building who know what it's like with some real or complicated HR issues. Small business members especially and entrepreneurs, they really can make fantastic legislators or local government officials. We're trying to encourage them to step up for office. And it's funny, every time we talk to one, you usually hear the same thing. They say, oh, I, I couldn't run for office. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Trust me, we got plenty of those. I'm one, I can say that with immunity. But from the small business entrepreneurial perspective especially, we need more of that. So we are promoting that. We're not the only group doing that. There's other groups out there trying to encourage people to run for civic office, but I did want to take this opportunity. If you all, if anyone listening or reading or writing or, or writing about this knows of anyone who might want to run for office, I would encourage them to look hard into it. In 2019, we, knew, we need new, fresh perspectives on that. One other piece we're doing this year is we're going to be rolling out something that we call a judicial scorecard, if you will. And uh, I want to explain why. There are three branches of government at the state level. Executive, legislative, and judicial. If I ask everyone here, hey, who's your who's your favorite governor ever? You can probably tell me. If I ask everyone here, hey, who's your favorite legislator either today or in the last cycle, or whatever, you can probably tell me that too. If I say who's the best judge that you know, most of you are gonna say, I don't really know. People, what people know about judges is what they know in the community. Do they go to church with them? Are they a neighbor? Did they grow up playing ball with them? And that's okay. But considering the judiciary is a third branch of government and the judiciary makes so many important decisions and some of those court costs are leading to insurance prices, we've got to educate people on what actually goes on in the judiciary. So we're gonna to try to pick, select cases, put information out there, just so the public can see how judges rule on what issues. This isn't a gotcha program. In fact, I think there are a high number of judges who go every day and are great independent arbiters of the law. And I think they will appreciate once and for all to be able to tell their story of what they're doing in the courtroom. But for those that aren't, we need to tell that story also. And so I just think we can no longer let a third branch of government not be able to have a more transparent description of what they're doing day in, day out to the people who elect, who elect them to office. So that's what we'll be doing. We'll get input from the court and others to figure out how to do that responsibly and fair. But we're excited about that because we think also that will help us recruit people to go run for judge one day and maybe uh, participate in that election cycle as well. The last thing why I think the elections are so important next year is because of redistricting. 
the new census is going to come out in 2020. And in 2021, this new legislature, the 70 plus or whatever new members, will write all these new lines. And since they're term limited, they'll be there for 12 years most likely. They'll probably write the same lines again in 2031. And so whoever we all elect, we the people, this fall, they're going to write 20 plus years of congressional lines, public service commission lines, judicial lines, etc. It's a complicated process. But it's especially critical for Louisiana because the last time we redistricted was when we were in the tail end of that Katrina Rita migration. So we've got a lot of population movement over the last several years. And so we need to have people in there who understand that challenge and they are going to represent the people as, as, as best as possible. So the two things I wanted to cover today on the economic front, Louisiana has some good news because of a lot of national momentum. And at the state level, there's a couple warning signs I really want us to be aware of and try to address. Under that vein, we released this report today. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. If you got questions, comments, criticisms, we would love to hear them. We want to get a productive dialogue on this important issue of ITEP and try to get out of some of the hysteria that's taken over this issue. We've got to get back to substance and figure out a reasonable path forward on this issue. And then the second thing I want to cover was the importance of the 2019 elections and why it's going to take as many fresh faces and new perspectives as possible. And we make no apologies for trying to go out there and encourage small business, entrepreneur people to run for office. Because we think if their voice is heard more often in the Capitol, we might get some more new, novel, and outside the box thinking in, in that building. And so with that, I appreciate the, once again the opportunity to be here, and I'll be glad to take any questions for Just a little under a year ago, and those recent round of changes. Yep. And now it's, you're asking for new changes. I guess what changed your mind on the program? Sure, so the question is, um, in 2018, Lobby endorsed the new changes. What changed? Why? Why the different message? Um, the 2016 executive order issued by the governor was extremely problematic. Um, led to a lot of confusion out there. Everyone pretty much agreed with that, including the governor, obviously, because he came back in 2018 and revised it. He and LED listened to uh, to input, provide that order. That was a that was a positive development. What we're seeing right now is again, if you heard my message, I think when you when you look through the reports, you may see some of the, the story we're talking about. Local input is not a bad thing, but the way it's being put together, I think if you look at how Texas does it, there's a way to tweak where we are today and get that input in a way that doesn't create some of the chaos we're seeing. And so I think that's why the distinction. On Follow up, uh, could you be a little more specific on what changes you'd like to see? You mentioned like a single point of contact. Is there anything else that wants to change? Yeah, well, the report's look good. I love you. But, uh, no, he, he has to uh, be specific on what changes you're recommending. And the, the two main ones in my mind are one, I think a single point of contact does help. Again, that should be a parish's choice. Put that into the and that's a lesson learned from Texas. The other piece is I think that, um, that there should be a upfront fair proposal out there. So the governor has said he wants 80% over 10 years. If that's what if that's what he prefers, then hey, I think that that's fine. The question is, what if a local parish, when we get their local input, what if that local parish wants to go for 85% because they want to go recruit many bathroom jobs? What if they want to go to 80 or 87% or default to the Board of Council Interest? One thing we saw here in Baton Rouge is after the school board vote, what's the first thing that West Baton Rouge said? They said, come on, we'll take it. You know, that's what they want. And so I think if we truly want local input, if we truly want that, which I think is good, then what we would do is we would set that, that number. Let's say the governor wants 80% over 10, set it at that. But then allow locals to, to use a single point of contact and say, you know what, maybe we want and offer a deal better. Than that. And let's see what the market says. What if they want to offer a deal slower than that? Well, right now, that's not allowed in the current governor's order. I think that would be a big mistake if we want to truly compete because of many of the metrics I said here today. So I think the best policy is that 80% is the floor, and then let them, if they want to go up, and many of them may say, no, no, we'll take it, we're fine, whatever. That's kind of their choice and what their input. And that's more aligned with what the governor's proposing today. I think that the four local hearings, what we're asking some of these entities, I'm not going to pick on the school board, but I'll use the school board as an example. These folks ran to make a difference in schools, to try to grind them or pick them to do good work in that space. They're not economic developers. And so if you're going to ask these people to be economic development analysts, you either have to send LED to every one of those hearings and do a thorough analysis so they know they have some information to vote on, or you can look at Texas and do more of a single point of contact mode 
And the third piece is there might be a better way to fix this issue. Represent, uh, Representative Foyle and Senator White have said they want to bring a bill. Trust me, there are a number of legislators who have reached out and said they're thinking about doing legislation as well. There might be another way to, to create this local input without some of the, the chaos we're seeing. And we're open to a workable solution. I hope the governor is too. So it sounds like the problem is mainly at the local level, not so much at the state level. Is there a way to cut the state out of the process entirely, maybe through a state constitutional amendment? If so, what you suppose? Well, the ITEP program is in the Constitution. And so it's, it started in 1936, it was enshrined in 1974 in the Constitution. And it does give a lot of leeway to the Board of Commerce and Industry or its successor board uh, and the government. And so that's where most of the, of, of the meat is in the Constitution. Now most people, I think, would argue that to do this appropriately, it should be a constitutional amendment, whether it be amendment or convention or whatever. If you want to change the program, it's absolutely more preferred to go in a constitutional amendment preferred. Um, the governor went through the executive order route and put some qualifications on there and criteria and said he wanted local input but put parameters on how the locals would do it. So I do think at some point we need to kind of figure out does the Constitution be, amend be amended? If so, is that during a convention or not? But right now, I think we just need calm and peace. Right now, we just need to kind of put some stability because some of the concerns we're hearing from the business side is I'm worried that they're just going to start looking elsewhere while we're you know, fighting over the, the minutia details of, of a minor piece. And so, as you say, you're not getting a more specific on what you said, but it sounds like you're saying whatever happens in this year's session that it should come to a constitutional, state constitutional amendment. Let me say it this way. I kind of believe in the pottery barn rule, okay? If you break it, you buy it. The governor used two executive orders to create a whole new system. I think there's some flaws in the system, but I think I'm very proud of our business members and proud of what we did earlier for the last couple of years. We didn't provide input and try to make it as good as possible. That's where I think the 2018 order came from. But I, th I think we still have gaps. I think we've seen in Baton Rouge lately, we've got a challenge right now. And so to, to put some stability into it, I think our number one name of the game is we've got to lower the tension. We've got to let the facts drive this, not, not the temperature of the moment. That's what you do for right now, but going forward long term, we can't live in an executive order world on this issue. I don't think that's appropriate anymore. I guess I, I think like the piggyback on Sam's question, I'm confused because one of the challenges we've seen is that our tax system has multiple entities that can tax at the local level, right? Yep. And so when you talk about a single point of contact, like, I mean, if your single point of contact is the school board, the sheriff is going to get pissed. You're bringing, you're bringing up political problems? I mean, seriously, let's be honest. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. These are local officials working together on a number of fronts. When there's an accident, when there's a spill, when there's an approach for what they're trying to decide on what, what, what they're going to do for economic development, why can't they get in a room like every other state tends to do and, and speak with the voice on this issue? I guess I don't, like, I, I like, don't understand functionally how you're having local input how it works to have a single point of contact, which when unfortunately, and I think a lot of people in this room would agree, we have many taxing entities that are And that is also, it's a huge problem. The, the many different, you know, Julie's asking, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be a question. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. The, the, you're, you're citing that we have so many different taxing jurisdictions. Right. That isn't it just going to make it worse, or is it possible to get them all on the same page? Is basically what, what, what you're saying. I'm asking, like, I don't understand what you mean by a single point of contact, but who is that contact? Well, let, let me say this the, the multiple taxing jurisdictions in Louisiana is absolutely one of the reasons why we have the worst, you know, one of the worst business climate tax climate reputations in the country. If you are a, a business of any size, big, small, anything, and you're in multiple parishes, <laughs> You can be assessed by every different parish at a different property tax or sales tax valuation and get audited by all those entities in different ways. Compliance is a nightmare on this front. And so what you're talking about is absolutely the right issue. And if we've got a coalition that's ready to go tackle that in the capital, I'll be the first one to say, hey, let's do a new speech all together. I'm ready to fix that because that has been broken for a long time. But what I hear from the capital right now is they don't want to touch that because politically that irritates people locally. And so what we have is an ITEP program that used to work in a way that brought all of the 
investment and jobs that I talked about here. And now it's created a different order because of the governor's executive order where you have to go get these local resolutions by boards, which don't, they're not economic developers. And it's this fragmented system which has put us in this purgatory. And so if you take the page from Texas, counties have the ability to speak with a unified voice on important things. I think economic development is an important thing. I have a lot of confidence in our parishes can do that and speak in a unified voice. And right now, you're seeing some select examples of that. I would say in southwest Louisiana, those entities are doing a really good job of getting together and trying to speak with a unified voice. And so that we've seen pockets of that happen. Yeah, I think I was asking more functional questions, like what, where does lobbying on this local point of contact be if you have, unfortunately, multiple points of contact, multiple taxi entities? I would, I would love locals to be able to designate that entity. Maybe it's a website. Maybe they put together a shared website, whatever. There's got to be a way that they can put a single point of contact out there to where a company knows because what happens is in these big companies, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, big company investments. Well, if you have billions of dollars to spend on a manufacturing site anywhere around the globe, you're looking at, all right, different places. Maybe it's Texas, Louisiana, some country overseas. You're looking at spreadsheets to a certain extent. All right, what are they offering here? What are they offering there? The numbers have to work, you know? And so we're losing on the spreadsheet because it's a process. There's no number there. Well, if you go talk to this board and then locally, if you get through those four, you have to have some ability to go to a parish website and say, when it comes to an investment of a certain number, a certain size, this is the deal, no matter who you are. To me, that takes the personalities out of it. That takes the, the anger and name calling out of it. And we get back to a numbers game. And I think the numbers game, in my opinion, make a lot of sense with it. Some parishes may say, we don't, we don't want that. We don't want these manufacturing jobs. That will be their, their, their option. With regard to the tort reform that you mentioned, uh, David Vitter in, in the gubernatorial campaign in 2015 very actively pushed the zero trial, the zero trial, zero dollar jury trial threshold. <clears throat> he, the next closest state being Maryland behind us from 50 down to 17, and 36 states having no threshold whatsoever, zero. <clears throat> Many people believe that that's what motivated the trial lawyers, the John Carmouches, the Gordon McKernans, to pony up six million dollars to bring up prostitute ads to ensure Vitter's defeat. Do you have any inclination as to whether the two major Republican announced candidates will be willing to take that, that take the banner where he left off and run with it on, in terms of that getting the jury trial threshold reduced to zero? Well, I, I would say that I would hope every candidate would, would see the need to reduce the jury trial threshold. And whether it goes to zero or some compromise in between, we're open to any solution that finds a way to lower insurance rates in this state, lowers those auto insurance states, stops putting that tax on the back of the farmers, stop putting the tax on the back of the truckers. We're open to any solution there. I'm sure they'll be rolling out their proposals, the two, the two uh, candidates on where they're on that. I'm assuming the governor will lay out maybe his proposal on this, whether it's changed or not. I'm, I'm ready to work with anyone and everyone on that issue, and I'll let them speak for themselves on what their agenda is. Then a quick follow-up. Any reservations at all that you didn't put your own name in the hat? I know you considered no, it. No, no. All right. <laughs> Calling for de-escalation around the rhetoric about ITEP. How then should the candidates treat this in the election in their campaigns uh, looking ahead? To the governor candidates? Yeah, go any election, but mostly governor candidates. Well, I think as long as it's in this kind of toxic, <coughs> broken posture, can you really blame any candidate for talking about it? I mean, it's a hot issue. It's, on, it's in the papers. It's in the coverage. It's on your Facebook feed. I mean, look, I think most candidates are a product of, of some of what they what they see out there. We've got a challenge with this ITEP issue. Now. I would love it if it doesn't become a political football. I would love it if we could find some type of compromise on this. I think we could. I think we're ready to work with anyone. I could care less about party or position or whatever on that. But it's broken right now. And it's, it, it, I think it's only the beginning of it. I worry about a spiraling effect there. And so I hope that this doesn't turn into a political issue, but it's an election year, and um, there's always that risk. So the sooner we can get to some resolution, I think the more we can avoid that happening. I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, uh, whenever, whenever I ask a critical question, the first thing they say is, well, every case is different. Uh -oh. How do you score cards uh, uh, judicial performance? Uh, they're civil, they're criminal judges, they're just the whole category of, of every case is different, but there are categories of cases. 
how do you work through the inherent difficulty? Yeah, so the question is, how do you do a score card judiciary that's fair because every case is different? Um, I'm paraphrasing, but I guess I'm paraphrasing. Um, look, I think that is really, you know, the, the, the part we're working through right now. Now, there's some models around the country um, of similar scorecards. And I say scorecard, I think one reason why it gets a little confusing down here is because from a legislative scorecard, it's very easy. A bill comes up, everyone votes. You just go to the scoreboard and you show what it is. It's very easy to do that. To your point, in a judicial aspect, not every judge rules on every case that goes there. So I think it's more of just um, a transparency initiative to where you're going to have several cases. There'll be an ability to pick the ones that are most critical to the business community, to free enterprise, what are the hot issues of the day, and what were the rulings and what were the positions on those cases. You know, it may not be every judge is on, uh, on, each, on each one because every case does not go through every courtroom. But it's the intent to just kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and let constituents around the state get a better understanding of what goes on in the judiciary. And again, I think there'll be a number of judges that will love the fact that they can kind of get in an in a, in a easy, understandable way some of the rulings they're taking. I hear from judges all the time who feel like they go out there and bust their tail and they, they view themselves as independent arbiters of the law. And it's hard to explain that because if you're not a lawyer, you never see it. And it's such a big piece of our economy. It's such a big piece of every you know, rule and policy we have. I think it's imperative uh, you know, on us and look, other groups. I think other groups, because they're doing the same thing. You know, put some of these issues out there. In fact, I don't know why the trial lawyers don't do this. I think it would be a great idea is if the trial lawyers went out and did their own version of a scorecard and said, here are the issues we think are most important, and here's where the judges voted on theirs. In fact, I would be glad to jointly release the business scorecard and the trial lawyer scorecard in the same document, in the same press gallery, to be here together. And that way, everyone's got a voice in the vote. Very fair, very impartial. Your organization is speaking up right now. Yes, sir. Any way for y'all to consider supporting uh, some reasonable increase in the state's minimum wage? Is that Questions about minimum wage. Um, we do impose uh, a state increase in minimum wage. Right now in Louisiana, we are reflected with the federal law that's similar to several other states in the South. And so we do oppose that effort. And I'll tell you why. Of the 2,300 members of the lobby, business members of the lobby, we're about 75 to 80 percent small to mid-sized business. Many of those, when you put a type of mandate on there that requires a certain payment level above the federal minimum wage, they may or may not be able to accommodate that. They may have to roll back. We've seen several studies that say you have to roll back some of the job offerings you offer, especially those intra-level jobs. And so we don't want those companies to go from 10 jobs to five jobs in order to account for that. And in some of those businesses, it could literally be the difference in, in open doors or not. I know many restaurants especially, some of them that I talk to, they operate on a one to three percent profit margin. That's not a lot when you're trying to keep folks employed. And so that, that's a big issue there. The other piece is there's other studies that come out and say that for every dollar that you go up on the minimum wage, it has the propensity to go about a dollar and a half, excuse me, a point and a half up on the unemployment rate. So we don't have a, we know we have an unemployment rate issue around the rest of the country. We don't want to inflate it because of some mandates coming out. And so if we if we just constantly go to capital for more mandates in order to do good things instead of create healthier markets, which have more jobs and more prosperity, we just have a different approach to getting to the same end result. We all want higher wages. We all want to fight poverty. I think that many of our members just feel like create healthy markets, create more investment, that's going to do it better than, than mandates and lawsuits. Yeah, it's just a different perspective. Uh, the commissioner of insurance has told me that the constant stream of ads on TV by uh, injury, personal injury attorneys gives the insurance executives severe heartburn. Any comments on that? That would be accurate. <laughs> 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 Yes, sir. Give an example of three or four businesses that decided not to do something in Louisiana due to our tax exemption in the last 12 months. The ITEP or just any tax exemption? or ITEP. 
I think, well, obviously, I think three or four examples. The, the SAS all, the, the question is, can you give examples of businesses that haven't come here because of the ITEP? And this is this is the angle that opponents to ITEP love to, to ask, because unless you can show the A plus B equals C, they don't believe it. And I'm not saying that to you all, but we hear that a lot from opponents to it. I would say, one, the SAS all testimonial is so that's pretty clear as you can get. They said they, they, wouldn't, they said they would not have come if the ITIP wouldn't have been there. So I, mean, I think there's a reverse engineering. I mean, I'm done with the question. I'd love to take a follow-up. There's a reverse engineering, you know, that, that can take place there. I think the other piece is, um, and look, I hate to, to, to talk about a, a company, but when it comes to Exxon, we saw Baytown get a big investment not that long ago. Excuse me, um, Beaumont. And so if you go back decades in Louisiana, the Exxon refinery in Baton Rouge was the creme de la creme of the organization. And then over about 20 years ago, or whatever the time frame was, all of a sudden it became, well, Baton Rouge and, and Baytown, they're both, they're both big, they're both creme de la creme. Now we're seeing major investments in Beaumont. And so if you just follow trend lines, I think when you don't have an automatic cutoff on ITEP changes. What you have is a slow down of investment on the vine, so over time, you see facilities that maybe don't grow as fast, or they could track uh, uh, at some point. And so that is what we hear from economic developers, from, com uh, from companies. And I mean, that's that's the You have not heard Exxon Mobil say they put their expansion in Beaumont because of tax exemptions. No, no. So you're misleading what Exxon Mobil has said. No, I, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I, I'm giving an example of what we've seen over time of a hostile tax climate. And there's probably a number of other, other factors out there. But we can put our head in the sand on this issue and say that, look, our complicated tax code and the way we collect it, the way we get business, it doesn't matter. We can say that uh, all of the bad tort laws we have, including that high insurance, it doesn't matter. We can put our head in the sand on this issue. I would argue our head's been in the sand since the 80s crash. And that's why when you walk around downtown New Orleans, which used to look a lot like Houston, Atlanta, it doesn't anymore. Where a lot of those big you know, companies, those big buildings that used to be filled with oil and gas, tribal or firms are in those buildings right now. And so look, I'm not disparaging them. They're just doing what the Louisiana state policy has incentivized them to do. But I think we have got to take our head out of the sand at some point. And the last thing I would say is, if the tax code is so warm and fuzzy and friendly to the business community in Louisiana, where's all the investment? Why aren't our skylines and our cities growing like Houston and Atlanta and Nashville and these other cities in the South? I mean, at some point, we have to be able to use some common sense in these issues that we can no longer say that a, a bad tort climate has no impact on insurance rates when we're so out of line. We can no longer say a complicated tax system and the way it's collected has no impact on business, they'll come anyway. And then watch other city, southern cities go up so fast while we just kind of like hang out in many of those areas. And so, you know, look, again, I still think that that compromise can be had on all those issues. I still think that many of the solutions don't require these big cataclysmic changes, just some tweaks here and there. And we're ready to work with anyone. I, I can't say we'll get to consensus on anything, but I think we have to, the last couple of years, it's been very in vogue in the capital. Let's talk about business don't pay their fair share, and business needs to do more. And I think what you're starting to see is the product of some of that, our unemployment rates and the softness of our economy, and some of the investments that we're seeing in other states. As a uh, former multi-decade member of LABI, your comment right there really strikes me and the two LSU uh, graduates in Houston, they're high taxes and high education. And I talked to an economist just before I got here, my degree also, also a, a MBA uh, from Tulane with uh, honors. And he said ITAP is where the plants are going to be anyway. He could have gone on to say that Exxon is appreciated this plan at zero. Like somebody saying, Remy, why don't you buy a new car? And I say, mine was fine and it cost me nothing. So it seems a, a surprise to me that you stand here today and seem to make it sound like LABI doesn't have a complete Republican legislature that won't even recognize income and revenues to pay teachers. And we need new people to step forward to be in the legislature. What's so your first thought? Is it, is it not? You are scared that the Louisiana public will see that the Affordable Care Act Question, please. And you're scared that they will not believe the things that LAPI have done in your career under general? Repeat the question, please. 
But the people of Louisiana are not seeing the difference between Texas and Look Louisiana you. and the things that have actually occurred, like the Affordable Care Act, et cetera. And your, your eight years were general and now in charge of LABI. So I think the question is, um, uh, we are not an organization that you think highly of, uh, especially me, and um, I need to reflect on that. Um, what I would say is, um, I think, this is my opinion, I think free enterprise is at a tipping point in Louisiana. I think the, the, the rhetoric and, and the commentary on business being blamed for everything Louisiana can't do is going to become more and more of a problem because of the international scale of economies. If you are a company and you're looking to invest in pretty much anything, you can go anywhere in the globe these days and ship it easily, transport it easily, do all those things. So I think we have to compete on a more grand scale. I think there was a time in Louisiana, many, many years ago, where you could get away with not fixing a lot of this stuff because there weren't many options for business. They were stuck here. I think in today's day and age, that's not the case. I think we compete on a global scale. So I think when we talk about things like tax policy and, and legal you know, climate policy, it's very easy to say, oh, we're being partisan or political or whatever. And people will have that perspective. I think the substance matters. I think that finding solutions on these policies are no longer something we can ignore. I think we could for a while. We can't anymore. And I think everyone is to blame for, for this getting to this point. This is a this is a problem since Huey Long in Louisiana. I'm not trying to personalize this on anyone, but I, I am saying, and I'm saying it without apology, that it's time for us to start fixing these issues and getting past the name calling and getting to some substantive discussion, because I truly worry of where the Louisiana economy goes for another five or 10 years if we don't do it. That's just my perspective. But thank you for the question. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.